everybody and welcome to Planet IMEX. My name is Jonathan Bradshaw. It's a great pleasure to be your moderator for this session. And it's a session I know so many of you have been looking forward to. It is Nature Works. Why create a more regenerative events industry? It is an informal group chat headed up by IMEX Group CEO, Karina Bauer. But before I introduce her, we would like some feedback for you. I'm about to make live the first of four questions that I give you 25 seconds to answer. They're obviously related to environmental issues and they'll really help IMEX understand where you are when it comes to this issue. The first one is open now. Please, as I say, could you vote on it? There are four in total. Each of them has four options, as you can see. How determined are you to act now and make more socially and environmentally responsible choices in your personal life? That's open right now. You can see those four options there. I'll give it another five seconds. This is really useful. Thank you very much indeed. Question two, as you can see, I will read it out though. How determined do you think your organization will be to act and make more socially and environmentally responsible choices in 2021? Let's have your views on that. Again, this is helping IMEX. It's a set of questions that were asked earlier in the year. IMEX are really interested, and I think the results will come up in the chat we're about to have now in the Q&A afterwards. So really, really useful. Thank you very much. Multiple choice number three. How important is it to you that environmental and social sustainability is integrated into the reboot strategies of the meetings and events industry? Let us know what you think. Interested in your views, giving back to the industry, some crucial knowledge that the uh, industry needs from the grassroots to know what your expected uh, behavior will be in this regard in the future. Thank you. And finally, let's have the last question. When attending an event in the future, how important is it to you that an event organizer or venue shows a strong commitment to sustainability? Let's give you 20 seconds on that, and then I'm gonna pass you over. Thank you very much indeed. Give you a few more seconds. This session in total is 55 minutes. It will finish five minutes before the hour. I'm now going to pass you over to Karina Bauer, who's going to conduct a informal conversation. I'll let her introduce the other members of the group. But then it's about 40 minutes when that finishes, you'll come back to me and uh, we will all have a Q&A session. So whilst you're going through this, I will uh, reset the Q&A and feel free to ask any question about any aspect that comes up within the uh, informal chat that Karina is leading. I'll close that last question now. Thank you for your feedback. Karina, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, John. And uh, it's great to be here on at the end of uh, our second day um, uh, for this fabulous session with Janet and Guy, who really have done the research for us. So over to Janet and Guy and the recording. Welcome everybody, thank you so much for joining us today on Planet IMEX for this session, Nature Works, Why Create a More Regenerative Events Industry. So I am delighted to be here today for this conversation with two very close industry friends, Guy Bigwood, Chief Changemaker for the Global Destination Sustainability Movement, and Janet Spears said, Faculty Director for Madison College. So welcome to both of you, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Karina. Thanks, Karina. So not only are you both very loyal friends and supporters of IMEX, um, but in fact, you've also both been our research partners um, this year as we've explored nature, what we can learn from nature and how this can really be applied to the business events industry. Um, and whilst we're not um, intending today to deep dive in detail on that research, we're keeping it light. We do have some really important points to um, talk about. And so on that research, it's 
been inspired by the IMEX talking point for 2020 and 2021 nature. And um, for all of you out there, it is out today. We've mm -hmm. called it the regenerative revolution, a new paradigm for event management. And it's primarily an introduction to the circular economy and the regenerative economy, which some people you know, watching this may not have heard of. And um, so we're going to try and give a bit of context to that today. And um, but before we go into that, I want to say a massive thanks to our sponsors, Merit International. Mm -hmm. They came on board um, to sponsor this research and the talking point last year. And through everything we've been through this year as an industry, they've stuck with us. So we're really, really appreciative of that amazing mm -hmm. support. So thank you. So, first of all, to Guy, um, you've obviously been um, the author of a large part of this research. And um, so I want to come to you first and ask you a little bit about it. The, the report asserts that for the global meetings and events industry to recover and flourish and thrive, that we're going to have to resist the temptation to adopt a COVID-19 recovery strategies that are just based on our old normal. Um, and is this about building back better? And if so, why? And why not just wait until we're all back up and running again and, and worry about this later? Mm, really great questions. Um, I think <clears throat> you kind of look back a little bit in history and look back at 2008 when we had the last crisis. And we kind of didn't really use that crisis for building back better. We built back the same way and kind of even kind of worse than some of the the errors in our economic system, um, and I feel like we're kind of reaching, uh, reaping some of the, the impact of that now. So now, not only do we have an opportunity to rethink and reimagine the future as everything is broken down, has collapsed really, we're against the clock. You know, we'll talk a little bit about that, I'm sure, later, but against the science. But the science tells us we have 10 to 12 years to turn this around on a climate uh, impact, on a biodiversity level, and on a... Um, on the kind of you know resources level, so we've really got we've got to use this downtime to rethink our future, and then not just create a future that kind of sustains, but create a better future. And that's the real, really exciting thing, which all our research is about. Mm. How do we create something that's better, more beautiful, more thriving, more flourishing? Yeah. So that's. <laughs> that's that. There's a sentence in the report that says we depend on nature more than nature depends on us. And I thought, you know, that really puts things into perspective, doesn't it? Because we we think of ourselves as very important. But in the aspect of the whole world and, and the nature ecosystem, we're, we're just little specks, really. I always remember that. I'm not sure if you ever saw that cartoon. And there's two planets talking to each other up in up in the universe. And one planet says to the other, he says, what's up? He says, oh, I'm not feeling really well. I said, well, what's my name? He says, oh, I've got a touch of humanity. He says, oh, don't worry, it'll be gone soon. <laughs> yeah, that says it all. And how, Janet, coming to you, what's your take on this? Where, where do you think uh, sustainability fits into the circular economy? Yeah, it's so interesting, you know, we think about nature as an object and nature is with us, a part of us, in us. We're made of carbon. Like <laughs> we are all organisms of nature. And just like nature, our events create new connections and new collaborations with each person that's a part of our event. And that contributes to the whole, just like nature. We are all one. And I think the pandemic has shown we are one system. We need to collaborate or we will not exist. And, you know, nature is regenerative. It's a regenerative ecosystem. It deliberately responds to the ecosystem around it. And so, you know, back to Guy's, uh, you know, little illustration of that comic. And so, you know, it will respond to us and we need to respond to it as it rejuvenates. What nature does after a crisis, after the fires in Australia, the fires in my country of California, what nature does is it rests, it pauses. Mm -hmm. So we should look at this time of not just innovative and do and go and create the new normal, pause and rest because that in itself is regenerative. And where we talk about sustainability, historically in our industry, it's really about referring to environmental practices. And the circular economy is bringing in 
new elements that really help us look at how we create differently. Sustainability, we have more agency and we have more responsibility in some of the outcomes. The, the circular economy really also is asking policyholders, regulators, businesses to be part of that closed loop system. So we're a part of it. And we have responsibility over sustainability now more than ever because we have, as event professionals, more connection to the outcome. And nature is counting on us. And nature needs us and we need nature to survive. Yeah, it's interesting because the report also um, says, you know, we are nature. Uh, and, you know, as you say, it's not an object. It's not something separate. It, we are nature. So it, it's I, I thought that was really interesting. And I thought it was interesting as well because it also talks about the fact that, you know, as we look to build back, as we look to grow the economy, that Accenture is actually calculates that, circular economy is the world's largest opportunity with potential to unlock four and a half trillion dollars in growth. So, you know, if it, it's interesting, I think, because this report really shows how you can marry nature, circular economy, building back better with economic growth, whereas usually, you know, commentators and politicians talk about them as if they're sort of against each other, almost like it's an either or. You can be you know, environmentally friendly, or you can have growth rather than what this report shows is that they're one and the same thing. So a, a super interesting point there is when we started the research, we had that first conversation in IMEX in, in Frankfurt in May last year. And we said, yeah, let's, yeah, it's got to be around nature and this circular economy. And that's where we started to, to kind of January, February, and then COVID happened. And then it really made us kind of sit back and reflect that, that nature is circular is a key part of nature, but it's more than that. And there's the, the circular kind of philosophy that we were thinking that we'd actually written, remember we'd written a report, was limiting. And it didn't take really this concept of living systems thinking, which Janet's just been talking about, and how everything is so interconnected and that is what we've seen how someone eating a bat or a pangolin in china has caused the collapse of the world economy hold on a second just think about that you know and so that's what really it's made us stop to think about and now what i don't know i think what i am what we've been learning as a team is that wow there's so much to learn mm from nature and that study of nature to innovate is called biomimicry um, and we can learn so much about living systems design and how how different nature is to machine-based design or you know linear-based design which is very much focused on quantity and efficiency versus harmony um, you know and then you know against resilience versus competition um, abundance thriveability, those things that nature is really good, as Janice just mentioned. Um, and I think we we have to step back a little bit and think about that and, and realise that the events industry is a complex ecosystem. Absolutely. And I mean, that, sorry, yeah, that just um, brings us really nice, actually, to a question, which is, can you explain a little bit more about that difference between that linear versus circular model that you talk about in the report and what really is regenerative thinking? What makes regenerative thinking different to what we've talked about in the past, which is sustainability? Right. So step back, degenerative thinking, right, which is really kind of fun what we're pretty good at, you know, we make, we use, we throw away, okay? You think about that, at the moment, we extract, what, 100 billion tonnes of stuff out of the earth every year. 8.6% uh, of that is recirculated, reused, recycled, okay? 8.6%. So we already know that by 2050, we need three, time, three earths to give us the materials. So that's the kind of extractive system. So let's extrapolate that to an event. You build a stand at IMEX, you build it, you make it out of wood and plastics, and then you throw it away. And the guys pick it up and they throw it in the ground. Okay, old style. Sustainability thinking is how do we make it a bit, how do we make it better? Yeah? Less wasteful. Okay, so we, uh, we, we make, we use, we recycle, 
okay so we get our stand we uh we we make it from plastics and wood and we recycle the wood we recycle the plastics and that's good it's a bit better right? regenerative thinking is that learning from nature remember nature is a circle if we think of that tree that's gr growing it's absorbing oxygen it's um sorry it's absorbing co2 it's releasing oxygen um its roots are activating the ground and helping other organisms its shade is helping other life and when it dies it degrades and then helps other things to grow so how do we do that in the events you know that circular regenerative thinking so how do we heal and and, and make better the planet so back to the trade show stand so yes we have to make it from um from recycled materials you know to that circular thinking of making it from you know recycled plastic already we have to make it to be redesigned we have to think about who made it you know is there a way we can involve disadvantaged communities in our supply chain to make our things and then when it's finished with what can we do with it can we reuse it can we um donate it so a lot of the kind of work that you've been on very much at IMEX on a journey about and I've done an amazing piece of work really in your kind of resource utilization. But um, that, how do we scale that to a whole nother level? And so that's really that kind of rethinking of journey. So from less bad to healing and really making a difference. Yeah, and there is some really amazing case studies, aren't there, in the report, you know, mm -hmm. looking at company like EcoBooth, um, where they're making booths entirely from repurposed plastics. I mean, just some, we'll go into some of those case studies a bit later, but it's good, I think, for people to know who are listening today that there are some really practical case studies that us as event organizers can take, because I know some of this can seem a bit theoretical um, sometimes. And Janet, on that, you know, you've been an event planner, you've been teaching events and experiential planning for, you know, three decades. Um, so I'm interested to think, to, to hear from you in terms of the practicality of this report and, and the timing and content and, and how valuable is it for the industry and for those of us on the front lines who, at the end of the day, have an event to plan? Right, right. It's, it's perfect. It's beautiful. You know when the best time to make changes when you're in the middle of change? Because mm -hmm. here's the neuroscience of it. If you continue to doing the same things, the, the brain circuitry gets deeper and deeper. When you have to do something different and we're forced into different, we're creating new brain circuitry. And so we have the opportunity. Innovation happens when change happens. It's not when you're doing the same things every day. So this is perfect because guess what? Tomorrow is going to come. And nature doesn't waste a thing. We need to think about that. We need to take the genius of nature and its wisdom and think about how do we not just extract and consume, but how, as Guy said, how do we regenerate it? And so when we look at what we're doing in our world around events, the intersection of circular economy, sustainability, it's human and well-being. It's about people. And so when we think about our job is to help people think better, be better, healthy performance, and looking at what are we doing, what's the best thing we can do to help this ecosystem be thriving and not just consuming in the moment. We know we're all working with a lot less resources than we ever have, which means we're also not consuming resources. So in this new way of doing, think about the whole system of what you're asking your attendees to not do, not bring, not expect, communication will be really, really important because that sets expectations as we know it. And so sharing with them why you're not doing these things, why you are. In North America, where our comfort level is 68 to 72 degrees. We have a very small bandwidth of comfort. Europe, you have a, you have a bigger bandwidth. So when we, if we shift that, why? Why are we doing that? So it's like, oh, the room is too hot. The room is too cold. Just that little thing we see on surveys. This is why it was thought about. We're not going to just always do the same things we've done. 
I think that's really interesting. It's something we've noticed at IMEX, actually, that when we've made changes, sometimes changes that we've been a little bit fearful about making, for example, getting rid of our printed show catalogue, getting rid of um, bags, you know, the, the, the bags that we used to give away and, and things like that. We were worried about it. But once we explained to people the um, environmental benefits, the savings that we were making and why we did it, People were very, very positive. And the other thing that I would say is that the attendees and the exhibitors really wanted to get involved and help. So mm -hmm. I think it's I think, as you say, communication is key. Um, going back to the research, um, Guy, you know, I, it would be great to maybe share some of the data in this um, report um, and some of the compelling reasons that have come out in this report for why should we do this now? I think there's the two kind of sides of the research that we looked at. So one was something like the, the, the data, and I guess secondary research, looking at what's happening to the planet, you know, looking at the, with uh, global heating happening at the moment. Um, we've got this 10 years now to change. And uh, cities came together in Paris 2016 and signed in a, the, the, the Paris Accord, which set a goal of, of a 1.5 degree change. Okay, and, and global temperature. And to get there, we have to cut global emissions to zero by 2050, and a, a, probably a bit more than half by 2030. So nine years away, right? Um, so that requires some pretty major thinking about to do, okay? This, you know, and so if you think about that. Um, so to do that, requires some pretty major thinking. This is what regeneration is. It's kind of rethinking everything. It's not just sustainability plus. Mm. So we have to rethink about travel and how we travel. Um, and, and that's some pretty hard, tough, big decisions. So I call the elephant in the room, right? And so what we're learning now, this mass innovation that we're seeing with technology that's allowing us to do this, is part of the future. We have to make that. We have to work out how we prioritize face-to-face -face meetings at the right time, uh, in the right way. Um, so there's that kind of data that we looked at. Then we looked at kind of what do people think right now? And we saw that in 2019, 97% of the 1,500 event organizers we reached out to had actually implemented some type of sustainability action. I repeat that, 97%. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a tipping point. I remember we first did this, Karina, I can't remember, it was 2008, and we had, I think well, the first year was 9%, then we got up to 14%, and then, no, 97%. It has tipped. Is that good enough, you know, is the question. We saw that 92% of the people thought sustainability had to be a part of reboot, uh, reboot planning, rebuild planning. So the people want it. If we look outside of the industry, we see globally 76% uh, of people, it was a survey of 30,000 people we looked into uh, around the world, said, you know, climate change uh, is as important as COVID, 76%. So there's some big data there. But then we had some shocking data. It was like only 12% of the 1,500 people we talked to said we have an advanced strategy. Um, so people had a strategy, but it was pretty, I can't remember now, but it was a massive amount of just starting their work and only less than 3% actually had a circular economy strategy. Um, so there was some real inspiration, some real hope, but some really kind of, oh, my God, we've got a lot of work to do type of thinking. I guess, um, you know, as an industry and also just globally, we've talked a lot about sustainability. So maybe that's really, you know, some of the reasons why, you know, people understand sustainability in a way that maybe 10 years ago they didn't. Mm -hmm. And we're kind of at that beginning sense of what is a circular economy? How does this really work? What is a regeneration policy going to look like? Um, and I'm, I'm interested, Guy, as well, in um, something that you said earlier. You talked about learning from living systems, biomimicry. Again, this is sort of new language for a lot of us. Can you explain a little bit more about what that is and, and how it applies to this research, but also how does it apply to us as event planners? Yeah, so I think a lot of this, I don't have all the answers because we're, we're, we're on the journey, but... Let's look at an example from outside of the industry, right? So um, 
where, and I'll give you two examples. So one is when they were designing the high-speed train in um, Japan. They had real issues with, with the train, the bullet train, hitting about 300 k's an hour, and it was making a boom. It was really creating a boom. And they were, they were trying, the designers were trying to work out what, how do we get rid of that sound? It was vibrations. And so some one of the designers, for some reason, was out fishing, and he saw a kingfisher swooping down. And he looked at the nose of the kingfisher, and it was a kind of this weird nose. He said, oh, I wonder if that could work for my train. So he went back, and he changed the design of the train and just made it like a long nose. And if you look at the high speed um, Shinkansen trains, you'll see it. It's a, it's a kingfisher nose. Voila, he fixed it. So if you type in asknature.com, you will find a database of 10,000 solutions that nature's given to different types of problems around the world. Um, another one is, and it's really booming right now, is how um, um, we can learn from mushrooms, how mushrooms grow and create a structure. And that mycelium structure, you, we can grow. And then we can shape into products and systems that replace plastic. So again, learning from nature to create new structure and packaging for, for your cups and your glasses, your stage sets, your AV equipment made out of mushrooms. Low cost, um, can be recycled. Um, but then it goes the next step, you know, we're now actually learning from that and creating structures that we can grow meat on the mushrooms, a kind of artificial meat, and you create these artificial hamburgers. So there's lots of things we can do. And so that's about now, how do we take that into stage set design, um, into thinking about how we just design the whole the event around maybe like permaculture principles and things like that. So there's been quite a lot of investigation done. And unfortunately, we only had a certain amount of pages in the report. Otherwise, I would have written thousands of them. Um, but really, for me, this is, this is a step one. And it allows us to do a lot more thinking over the next few years. Thank well, you. And Karina, you know, biomimicry is, there's so many things that we can learn. So let me ask a question. Where's one of our stress points as event professionals that really stress us out? One of them is when we see a, uh, doors closed and people gathering and there's blocks that people can't walk down the hallways, there's, right? And so if you think about it, so biomimicry, think about a river, a stream. And think about big, giant boulders blocking that water. And so where we look at the flow, our, of course, we're talking about traffic flow. We're talking about aisleways. But if we actually add little elements for people to stop, connect, sit, so that they regulate the flow yeah. of who comes in, really help solve the problem and we haven't done anything. Instead of saying spending resources of wayfinding and signage saying, Doors will open in 10 minutes. You know, it's like really think, we have to rethink. What we're asking is to rethink what it is we that nature can solve for us that isn't consuming more resources, that's helping us create better experiences. And biomimicry is really one of the keys to thinking about it, whether it's fractals in design. Mm -hmm. So that's a new word. Let me say a word we know, gobos. We can use, and a fractal is a snowflake. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a design that's never ending. So looking at adding gobos with these fractal designs allows the brain to see that, get shots of dopamine because we love it. We love nature. We love these things. So there's a lot of low-hanging fruit elements that can create better experiences and create a better world for us. <laughs> and Janet, as um, somebody, you know, who teaches students every day at Madison College, do you see an increase in appetite amongst your students and amongst the younger generation for this kind of um, biomimicry, for utilizing um, and learning from nature to um, design events? Yes. Oh, yes. Because they want the world around when their grandchildren are around. And so while we're in the world of social media and hashtags, people don't follow hashtags. People follow their heart. And they have a lot of agency over their voice in communicating it on a lot of platforms. And so they know that they have power and in, in, in influencing, and they will be. And even I teach online, all my classes online, 
and I hear all the time, it's not good enough. I need this. Like, mm. And I'm like, you're telling me it's not good enough? <laughs> and I'm like, and so it's like, right. They have much more uh, empowerment and voice. And I'm so excited because so many of the people coming in are women. Are you know? And so, yes, I think, which means for those in academia, up your game. Really think about this, not just green meetings, but really think about adding these elements into the business models. If you're teaching business in, as a master's in our, add this in, you have to. So it's they're going to ask why if you don't. So it really would be something that we need to think about as a whole system from the people coming in, academics teaching it, to the people doing it. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a great segue maybe into my next question for you, Guy, which is maybe you can take us a little bit through the new framework that you're mm -hmm. introducing to the industry, that we're introducing together through this research, um, which is called Hanua. Um, it's an ancient San word from Southern Africa. I hope I pronounced it right. Yeah which means the gathering of good fortune through living in harmony with our natural environment. So it's um, over to you to like give, give our uh, viewers a little bit of a, a snapshot of that. Okay, good. So um, first of all, we decide, we looked at kind of key principles of um, what can we use as kind of rules of thumb as how we design events. So one was how do we design out waste and pollution? Okay. So, Let's go back to the trade show, right? So how can we redesign, at least rethink that trade show stand so that it's not actually producing waste? So maybe we're renting it, you know? Maybe we're um, we're going to reuse it lots of different times. So then how do we then keep the products and materials in use, okay? Um, so then how do we design for inclusivity and diversity? So again, it's not just environmental things, it's about people, right? So how, as I said before, how do we think about who makes this, this the stage set? How are we treating them? How do we how do we think about the people that come and visit our trade show experience? Are we being inclusive to every type of race, gender, um, uh, and and different kind of diverse aspects of the people that come and visit us? Okay, what can we do within that design that allows it? better access for people with mental or physical disabilities, okay? Remember, over 10% of the people visit uh, a trade show have some type of physical challenge, okay? Then how do we regenerate natural systems through that aspect of work? So this could be something like, you know, using uh, more nature-based materials, okay, and ones that are regenerative, so woods and walls and things like that that are easy to, to recycle and reuse. Um, it's also thinking about what we do with the stuff that we throw away and not landfilling it, either turning it into um, energy or ideally um, breaking down the, uh, the molecules, the, the molecules into something that can be reused again. So these are some of the key principles. So it kind of builds a lot of the, some of the, the main circular economy thinking from like Ellen MacArthur, but it's really starting to put humans and what we call the human sphere back into this because humans are giving into uh, this energy and resource. It's not just about nature's resources and man-made resources. So that's the kind of the, the first part of it. And then we kind of started to think through th the elements of a, of a, of a framework. Um, and so one is like, you know, from the start is redefining your strategy. I'm really thinking, are we kind of, you know, are we travel agents or are we change agents? You know, we bringing people together in our event just to get them to come and visit our destination or, or what are we really trying to do? Uh, and how can we really use that event to impact the sustainable development goals? Um, you know, how do we do it to, you know, generate the economy? but also change inclusiveness and diversity and pop, reduce poverty, and et cetera. So really re redefining what the event's all about, thinking about do we need the event, uh, you know, how we're going to make it hybrid. I think all events probably in the future will be hybrid to some degree. So from there, we can then start to think about that brand, is, brand experience. Is what are we trying to communicate when people come together? Okay, how do we build the brand experience? Um, 
then you know to build that brand experience and rethinking through the materials and, and and how it's worked is you know what's our supply chain look like is it you know do we work with the the, the massive big catering company that um has you know 20 30 percent of the market share or do we work with smaller more or um social enterprises who are you know really very much linked into the the local economy you know what is you know that doesn't mean the big organizations don't have to be like that but we need to look for different types of organizations from there i think it's kind of important that we're kind of um reviewing our resource flow at the bottom here and understanding you know what's the money the resources the water the energy um the materials coming in and what's going out when we finish the show how much are we recycling how much are we reusing um how much are we giving back economically to the local community then obviously a focus on regenerative resources and, and thinking as i talked about before but then it's kind of flipping that around and saying look at people look at the people and how do we regenerate people in nature through the food we serve food is such a powerful element in an event as we all know it really is the thing that literally hits us in our stomach um, and so we can really be a catalyst for a, a local food movement, so reducing our food miles, but really telling a story from food, telling the culture uh, of our host destination through food, changing people's eating habits. I mean, the amazing work that you've done at IMX of, of getting to be eat, getting people to eat beyond burgers and things like that, um, serving healthier food that keeps us more awake. So that kind of regenerative aspects of food is key. And then that focuses into the, the communities. How do we how do we involve the community in our event design process? How do we give back to them? How do we benefit them? Um, so it's just a, such a key part. And the communities is, is a very wide, is a big word, isn't it? Because that's the, the communities is the, the local citizens who often aren't included. Communities is our participants, it's our staff. So how do we involve and and, um, and regenerate all of those people? And then lastly, I think is a kind of key thing is, as you, IMEX again is such a great example of this, is reporting our impact. If we don't measure and we don't communicate transparently, then we don't get better. You know, we can't manage without data. And so here's a bit of a cycle, and the cycle is empowered by people, by processes, technology, and ultimately collaboration of all those key points. Um, and so this is this is our regenerative event framework. Um, it's a version one. I'm sure it's going to change over the years, but it's something to really engage people around and and discuss and think through. Thank you, Guy. And it's um, I think it's fantastic. I love the circularity of it. I love the regenerative thinking. And you're right, you know, the reporting of, of the impact is so important for us at IMEX. It's been transformational, really, um, sort of having the courage, I suppose, to report the failures, um, to, yeah. to report where you haven't maybe um, met your goals but that allows you to build and to improve for the future and and that's been very freeing actually for us because it's allowed us to learn and be very transparent and also get advice um, from the wider community. And it's um, okay to, to, to screw up and not do well I mean that's mm. that's brilliant and that's I think that's kind of what we're learning from the whole online experience over the last six months. And this rapid innovation that we've seen, and Janet said, we've through pressure we've innovated, and we've allowed ourselves to screw up and and learn and get better. And wow, what we're seeing is amazing. So how do we take that six months of innovation we've done in our IT around online and apply that to the to our next phase of evolution, which is bringing people back together again? Absolutely. Now we're getting near to the end. I want to hand it over to um, John shortly to um, take questions from our audience. So I'd like to just finish off by asking um, each of you a bit of a provocative question, which is that some people still have a fear, I suppose, that if we look at or if we really focus on sustainability, we focus on circular economy, on nature, that um, actually we're going to reduce our events, 
that it's somehow going to be harmful to events. And maybe, Janet, maybe you can start off by just um, explaining, I suppose, what are the one or two key takeaways that you think people should take away from this research, but also this whole concept? Uh, and, and should we be fearful of this in any way as the events industry? Yeah, I think that's a great question, a great closing, because we need to remind ourselves that by not doing something or doing something, it, the, the world isn't an either or, it's an and. By doing these things, we are creating a thriving community. If you don't do these things, they will dry up. So we sort of don't have a choice. Be a part of the process. If you are stuck in fear, move on and you will move on. Fear decreases innovation. The brain doesn't have new ideas when we're under threat and stress, which we are. So when you think about these things, sustainability, circular economy, regenerative processes, it is an and. And we can and start small. I live 300 miles away from the fifth largest river in the world, the Mississippi River. And you know how big it starts? A pinprick. Start small. You can make a difference and change. The nature is has small ecosystems and large. And it's and we are all a part of it. So if you do one small step, you're adding to the community that we all live in and need. I love that. Thanks for that, Janet. And that's certainly something we at IMEX have learned. The only way we've um, sort of got to the position we're in now in terms of the sustainability of our events is by starting small and then every year building more small things on top of those and and mm -hmm. eventually you have quite a big program but actually reading this report i know that we've got so much more to do we, we're actually still at the start um guy let me go over to you for the last word i think it's building up with um, what janet just said um you know look at nature nature doesn't have greed it doesn't have pollution it doesn't have waste it doesn't have unemployment nature has abundance Okay, it has harmony, it has wellness built into it. So let's take that through us. Let's take this real magic moment of innovation we've got. Let's take this spirit that's allowed us to do amazing events like Planet IMAX. Let's take that forward into the redesign. And let's not just create something that survives. Let's create something that's better, that's more beautiful, that we're going to party harder at, that we're going to enjoy, we're going to just be better and have more fun and and, and, and uh, there's more love in it, I think. So I think it's, you know, it's a step change in, in how we think. It really is a paradigm shift and that's a bit of a cliche to say, but this is a paradigm shift and we have to use it to build back better. And that is the regenerative revolution that we are talking about. Brilliant. Thank you. That's a fantastic way to close. Thank you, Guy. Thank you, Janet. And um, we're going to go across to John now and try and take some audience questions. Thank you very much. Yeah. Welcome back. Hello, Karina, Janet, Guy. Can you join us? Let's see you on screen. Hello. Thank you. Hello. Great to see you all. You're joining us from all around the world. Uh, we've enjoyed that really interesting chat, observing you discuss such an interesting topic. Um, I think I'm going to start where I just finished before you started, Karina, and ask Guy about the results of the polls. I didn't mention to the audience, Guy, but actually there were four questions that you asked earlier this year. Tell us what you have seen from the results. Anything you want to pick out? I know you're particularly interested in what the reaction from the audience was. I'm, um, I'm pretty excited uh, in one way and, and, and fascinated another way with the results. So uh, one of the questions we asked was um, how important is it that sustainability is integrated in the events of the future? Um, and so when we first asked this question, uh, in February or January, 90% of the people said this is important. Uh, when we asked it in May, 92%. Uh, now we're up to 96%. So that's kind of, you know, it's an interesting tendency, the first step. So that's question one. Uh, the second question is, how determined are you um, to integrate 
sustainability into your uh, event organization. Um, and so when we asked it in January, 42% said they're very determined and they're actually prepared to pay a little bit more, five to 10% more was the, the range. Same question asked in May, it got up to 48%. Now 63% of, of the audience today said they would implement sustainability, even if it in, uh, required a little bit extra. Um, so yeah, there's a couple of data points that I think are interesting. So it's kind of proving the shift we're seeing of, you know, even though there is a big crisis, even though we're gonna be really sh looking at the bottom line, in, we have to keep focusing on sustainability at the same time. And of course, the result, the whole report is about how to do that. So it's good for the bottom line. Excellent. So positive news. Um, great stuff. Thank you, Guy. I know you turned that around very quickly. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Janet, perhaps I can um, ask the second question we've got to you. We've got so many of them. Um, have we all been spoiled, Janet? Uh, too much food, too many free rides, too much choice. Does that need to change? And if so, how? You know, spoiled is a judgment. So I would say no. But what I would say is the amount of abundance that we have been giving and been sharing is a little bit too much for the ecosystem that we live in. And so really thinking about how we are mindfully using the resources, sharing the resources, regenerating the resources is really important. The heart and the, and the soul and the mind of people are really important. Comfort is important. Feeding all of that is important. So I wouldn't say that we're, we're uh, spoiled, but I think that we have gotten used to some creature comforts that we have been shifted into a place of we may need to restructure and reform how we really feed the soul and the spirit and the heart and the minds of people that take care of their needs and still give them luxury, still give them the comfort uh, that they're looking for. So much of what we witnessed um, related to Daniel Fox's presentation. I know that was recorded just before it, so you wouldn't have known Daniel's content, but so many um, similarities and, and uh, yeah, things that identify between both sessions, which is a great thing. It's cohesive. This message about nature, about the environment is cohesive, which is fantastic. Um, Janet, Guy, I don't mind which one of you takes this, um, but it's been upvoted on Slido. When you researched the report, did you notice um, that the younger generation is more engaged with sustainability? Hmm. Um, that was interesting. We thought it, that would be the answer, and the answer is yes, they are. But it was only, I think, 1% different, the answers. And when we, we cross-tabulated everything looking at ages, and really I couldn't, I mean, is a kind of 1% difference, but not the big jump that we expected. So us oldies are as kind of committed to um, to sustainability as, as the uh, the younger generation. Okay, thank you. Um, Janet, one for you, not necessarily a specialist area of yours, but one that I'm sure you that comes up when you're lecturing. It's regarding smaller events. You know, we've got perhaps a focus um, on focusing on the larger multi-thousand congresses and conferences and exhibitions and business events. But we've got a question here. What are the best ways for smaller scale events, weddings, fundraisers, smaller social gatherings to be able to include regenerative practices? So let me give you an analogy. <clears throat> if you think about one of the world's most amazing natural phenomenons in the world is bird migration. If you think of your event not as a destination of start, stop, consume and finish, but you think about it in that circular migration, people are coming to your event, feeding you, uh, they're learning information, they're sharing, celebrating, and how are you helping them go back to their home being more successful, feeling more inspired, feeling happier, healthier, more connected? I mean, I think that's what we're really sort of talking about is regeneration instead of that linear thought, whatever it is, small, large, celebration, education, all those purposes, goals, they fit into the model of regeneration. And same thing with the birds. They go to spots and they feed, they store up, and then they come back to the places in the different uh, ecosystems. Migration stitches the world together like nothing else. Even weather systems don't do that. Our events do the same thing in the global world of stitching humanity together. So looking at your event differently than just a destination, a spot in time. And you come, go, and you leave. Thanks, Janet. 
Guy, one specifically for you. Um, in your experience with the GDS movement that you head up, how are cities changing and how will this affect the sustainability of our events in the future? So specifically regions and cities, have you seen some practices that you'd like to highlight? I think we're seeing a big change in cities, aren't we, right now? I mean, cities have been the hot spot of COVID. And so cities are, are redesigning at the moment to create more space. Um, we're getting like, I live in Barcelona, so roads have been closed, making more pedestrianized. Um, transportation's changing, um, you know, walking is being promoted, things like that. The whole concept of the 15 minute city is coming out. So we're seeing a lot of that happen. And we now just started to see tourism and the events sector of the cities really thinking, oh, my God, we need to really rethink how the city works. So I think it's really early to say what that's going to look like. But us at the GDS uh, ind Index and the movement, mm -hmm. we're leading lots of different projects now with, with big cities around the world, really th rethinking how we move people around, how we feed them. Um, how we give them an experience and how we do that regeneratively so that the events themselves are really giving back to the local community and to local nature. Thanks, Guy. Janet, you've got another report coming up very soon. Um, tell us a bit more about that. So we have a report coming up called The Nature of Space, and that's where we really sort of dig into some of the logistics and looking at nature and our logistics together and, and the intersection and marriage of those, such as we look at and we talk about the use of lighting. Turns out that lighting builds trust. And we're talking and we know looking at diffused lighting, looking at prospect and range of seating of where points of view are and where do we like things. We're looking at um, uh, landscapes and, uh, as I said earlier, fractals and using design elements inside so we can accentuate the brain and the neuroscience of it, as well as helping people connect and learn uh, is what we, as we know, is important in our events. So that piece really sort of digs more into the practicality um, and looking at how do we integrate some of these things that we're talking about in the first report. When does that, when's that you out, Janet? Uh, that'll be coming out this fall. Uh, we're rolling these out, each one, and this one was the first one that we're rolling out for Planet IMAX. So we'll be seeing that in coming months. John, if you just jump in there, um, Mary International, who is our, our generous sponsor of this research, has done some amazing thinking at some of the hotels around biomimicry and how you use nature to design hotel rooms and spaces. Um, so there's some really fascinating work out there. Uh, that's happening at the moment and lots that we can all learn um, and really start to bring into, in, into how we plan our events. And that's the great thing of this project that we're doing. And thanks to IMAX for really being this pioneer is that we're, we're just starting here. We're just kind of kicking off an, an amazing piece of research. And, you know, and, and we're all excited about where what, what happened to this and where we go. And we, we don't pretend that we've got any of the, the final answers. This is really a, a launch pad. I reckon I've got 90 seconds left. So I've got one question uh, that either Janet, Guy, even Karina can jump in. People still feel sustainability costs more. That's an observation of the questioner. Could you say something about how sustainability, when truly integrated, isn't in and of itself more costly? I think we should ask that one to Karina. Yeah, I think so too. <laughs> yeah, I'm happy to take that one. I mean, I think we've come a long way is what I would say. Um, the more um, that all organisers, event planners, and the more the, the industry embraces regenerative and sustainable solutions, the more the cost of these solutions will come down. Uh, so already over the past five years uh, at IMEX, we've seen that, that the cost of different products, um, say something like recycled carpet or um, boards that don't use plastic foot foam or signage that doesn't use plastics and um, these kinds of products were unusual five to ten years ago they're not unusual anymore more people are using them the cost of them has come down and in and really I would say if we do regeneration properly it should be cheaper in the long run so we need to um, start and continue on this journey together um, to make sure that all of those costs come down but it doesn't have to be more expensive and I'll just add to that, just to kind of thing is, I have a phrase which is progress, not perfection. So get into action, do stuff, focus on the actions that don't cost more, make a progress and get on the journey. Last word, Janet. 
uh, you know, just keep doing what you're doing as a profession and industry. We're driving innovation and we're driving change and we can change behavior faster by the work we do. So we need you now more than ever to really sort of start, start small, go big. The impacts can really make a difference. Thank you, Janet. Karina, please just give one last plug for the report we've been basing today's session on. Absolutely. So we've launched the report today. If you go to imexexhibitions.com forward slash research, you can download the report for free. It's called The Regenerative Revolution. Really very much hope that everybody does take a look at it. It's a detailed report, but it's a really great read and it's a beautiful read. So thank you to Marit International. Thank you to Guy and Janet uh, for authoring the report. And thank you to the IMEX team for the beautiful design of it. Karina, Janet, Guy. Thank you very much indeed. Everyone watching, there's plenty more to explore on Planet IMEX. Enjoy everything else it's got to offer. See you at the next session. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.